Yeah, it's Friday Night Live. So we don't really have old shit tonight. I do, in a way, I have old shit. Well, there's you, mate. Right? You. Yeah. You're old shit. I know. No, I do. There's even know. older shit tonight. I kind of thought that was two of you. I kind of thought that two of you were the, were the old shit. Bill's the yeah. old. And I'm the shit. <laughs> yeah. That's what it is. But what we do, uh, we've got a couple of rifles here, which we're going to talk about later on. We've got a ticker and a lithium. I'm going to pull them apart and show you guys the differences. Or and, in, and the similarities. Or in traditional Zane style, you've got to pull the piss out of them. <laughs> okay, just for you, Trent, I'm going to try and find some positives I want you to, find to the, the design of those guns. I want you to find the good in them tonight. All right, I'll try and find the good in them. Who wants to say that? Give us a thumbs up if you want Zane to find the good in the Basically drones. wants to, to talk something up for once. Yeah. Because he's good at finding the bad in them. Let's see if we can find the good in them. It is easy to find bad things in yeah. So maybe I should just walk yeah. the... I'm just counting to see how many... There's only 20 people watching. Oh, there's a thumbs up. So everyone wants me to pull the piss out of it. One person wants to... It's sounding... And one other person. It is sounding like that at the moment. There isn't any yeah, other thumbs up. And that thumbs up was probably you. So anyway, hang on, it is now. But we're, we're here to talk about Bill's knives. Oh, sorry. Which, uh, you had more than that. I did. I don't know. You ain't. No, I don't think so. Did you do the course the second time? No, I did it the first time. Oh, but you didn't do it. Okay, well that's why, you know, I know you made those ones on your yeah, first course. That's right. And these, I think, are a piece of Toyota rear spring. Something like that. Yeah. So the, the story is, how many years ago now? Probably seven years ago, oh, eight years ago. Yeah, a while ago now, seven years, six or seven Me years. Me and the stock maker and Bill went and did a knife making course with a knife maker, he's from down south, and he's um, very well qualified in manufacture of knives. And there's quite a number of people that I've actually met a few people who've done his course as well. And uh, it's a very, very interesting course. It teaches you, but we did it primarily to learn more about um, heating and, and um, the forging of, of parts and material and all that sort of stuff. Because it's really handy for what we do here. But also it's, it's handy to know how to make knives. And Bill made two knives on his first course. So he did exceptionally well. I thought, I thought I was top of the class. You were certainly the fastest in the class. <laughs> you didn't fuck around like I did. I fucked around. I only got one made on the first course. <laughs> Anyway, so Bill, yeah. tell us about which one did you make first? I think I made it. Yeah, I made that little one first. Um, mainly, mainly, as Zane says, to learn the technique and to learn a bit about um, forging and tempering uh, so that you can get a strong blade, but a, a blade that you can still sharpen and will keep a keep good edge. Um, and that, that was the... Um, my first attempt, I know I thought I'd make a bit bigger one, might come in handy, uh, but I've got about 20 knives at home. Uh, so it's just stayed here at, on my bench. But I'll bring it out occasionally just to have a look and remember the techniques, the, some, some of the, 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 the ways that the guy uh, showed us. Uh, just just briefly go through the process for making the knife, if oh, you can remember, because yeah. I'm fucking fucking remember. <laughs> because you've got the well, first stage was forming the tip, wasn't it? Okay. We got the we got the piece of steel and we formed the tip on the yeah. top of the knife. Yeah. And then, because the knives are tapered from the back of the spine of the knife to the blade, we actually before we started forging the knife shape out, we actually had to put a curve in it. Yeah, that's right. So we curved it, so like a cookery style knife, you know, like so I had that forward curve on it. Because that way, because when you when you forge the knife, you have to thin it out towards the blade end. On the, and on if, the blade side, yeah. So if you're thinning out the blade end, but keeping the spine thick and not flattening that out, if you're flattening out the blade end, it spreads it out across the blade end, and the knife Straight actually up. bends backwards. Straight, it straightens it up. Yeah. Well, only because you put the bend in at first. That's right. If yeah. we didn't have a bend in at first, it would you would end up with a, quite a curved knife. Yeah. So the first like knife, skinny knife. Exactly. The first yeah. knife that I made was more of a skinny knife. And I would have made it differently in hindsight. Um, 
But yeah, the first stage that I remember was was putting that curve on it. So you had to you had to try and think about beforehand what sort of shape you wanted to end up with after you've yeah, you put you the, the the taper on. What do they call it? Distal taper, or is, or is that the tang? Yeah, yeah, the tang. Was that a distal taper? I don't know. So, it was something that was called the distal taper. You had me? Yeah. All right. Bye, so Ross. Ross. <clears throat> yeah. So when Ross left beers here, so we're going to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> so piece. when you're making the tip first, is that where you're deciding whether it's going to be what style of knife is, like Tanto or something yeah, like well, that? How, how thin and you know, long and tapered the blade is. Yeah. So you would make... A long tip first, so you get you get the steel, heat it up, and put it on the anvil, and then not like so you're going over the edge of the far edge of the anvil, and you actually you're putting a tip on it like yep. that, and then like that. So and that sort of determines how long and thin the blade's going to be. Yeah, okay. So if you want most of the blade to be quite thick and yep. strong, you will just put a little short tip on it. Yeah. If you want it long and slender, you put more of a tip on it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, these are both the little this little short knife I made first is by far the strongest. It's, it's got a, 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 a quite a strong back to it. Hang uh, on a sec. We can't yeah. see anything back there. Right. Yeah, the, the short knife has got quite a strong back to it, or down to about here somewhere. Whereas the this longer knife has got a thinner, slimmer blade and not as strong a back. Uh, probably ends at about the same, starts off a, a thinner though. But um, yeah, it was a very interesting course. And it, it, just I ran out of time, I ran out of time here. So one day, but one day I had a little bit of time and I decided to make some other, more like letter opening type knives. And I got an old Damascus barrel shotgun and uh, and how do they make Damascus barrel shotguns? They don't. They used to. But they don't. <laughs> as far as I'm aware, it was by wrapping a bunch of wire around a mandrel and hammering it. Yeah. Mm. They used to twist the wire up first, you know, four or five strands of wire. Uh, they had a mandrel that was the shape of the inside of the, pretty well the inside of the barrel. And they would wrap it around, heat it in a forge, hammer it out. So it welded all the wires together, and that's why you end up with these. Yeah, but that wasn't done like that, was it? Because that's got quite a special pattern on it. It would have been wound a different way, probably, it, to, to give it a bit more elaborate sort of look. Yeah, Some yeah. Damascus barrels, you can just see the lines running around and around the barrels, you know, and it's quite cheap Damascus. But that yeah. is something special. Yeah, you know? this it's not just standard Damascus. This, this material came out it's of It's gone a bit rusty, so it's hard to see. But an old English shotgun. There's... No, that's not the one. That's, so it's like a real... That's that's a, a, a beautiful pattern of Damascus in that piece of... They, they would have done it um, in a repeatable fashion, so that they ended up with a, a repeating pattern on the pattern, barrel. Yeah. And the idea, um, from what I understand, some of them made uh, out of differing wires, so that the, the wires had more or less carbon in them, which is whether they understood that or not at the time. But uh, then when, when they browned the barrels, which was a, a process uh, of um, putting a, a finish on the outside of the barrel, that's when you got this pattern standing out because the differing metals that they use is the, the um, to wind the, the Damascus barrel up came up in different colours and or different shades of, of grey or black, but uh, mainly grey. This particular these particular knives are made, these little knives are made out of um, it was an English shotgun. I can't remember the name of it now, but. A reasonable quality shotgun, but it was well and truly worn out, and loose and rattled around and so on. So I split the barrels, took the unsoldered the barrels, split them down the middle, flattened them out, and started and started using. I've got lots of this left. Um, if I knew where to find it now, I'll probably I've hidden it somewhere. But, um, but so the steel quality on these things isn't terribly great. 
No. So you can't really get an, a, a sharp edge no, on the cutting. Right. You won't. You won't get a very sharp edge on those. The the. Um, I'll have the black death. Thanks, mate. The um. Appreciate it. You said before, the, Phil. Sorry? Instead of bluing, you said browning. Yeah, it's a, a browning. It. I can't remember the, the combination now, but it's to save bucket. Nitric nitric acid, I think, is used. Yep. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the uh, components of it. And it, later on, it's a, it's, a, it's the same process. Yep. Later on, they added extra chemicals, yep. um, like sodium hydroxide, that sort of stuff. What it does is it rusts the steel. Mm -hmm. yep. Then you kill the rust, and you cart it off, and you're left with a very, very thin layer of rust. Mm -hmm. And you do that over and over and over until you build up a really thick rust layer. And it's brown, that's why I call it brown. Yep. Technically, Rust bluing is browning. It's the same process. They just use different chemicals to make the rust turn that blue colour yeah. instead of brown. Yeah. Um, and caustic bluing is like a, just a modern process modern version, version of that. Yeah. But yeah, this browning is this, that's the original bluing. Yeah. yeah. All bluing is technically brown. We just can't call it browning anymore yeah. because it's not brown. Mm. Yeah, right. done, most of the bluing nowadays is done in a hot hot bath of about 110. Degrees C. It's colder than that, isn't it? Okay. It's colder than that. <laughs> Just above boiling. 325 Fahrenheit. Is it? Yeah, 320 Fahrenheit, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. They, all the salts and everything they put in there brings the, temp the boiling temperature up. That's right, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's about 320 Fahrenheit. Sure. Well, if anybody knows what it is, give us a shout out. Yeah. Try oh, guys, from, guys from Alexander's on that. I don't know. Yeah. They're, oh, they're, and they're definitely watching. I just remember, like, 15, 20 years ago, whenever it was, get, being down at Barnsley's yeah. and helping him do bluing down there. Yeah. And I remember looking at the temperature gauge and it was like 320 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Yeah. What's that in, in degrees? Like 140? Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Couldn't tell you because I don't think it's a true mathematical equation. That to be honest, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. It really doesn't. Like, it's like zero is not. What? Zero is what? It's like, I've, I've seen a yank trying to minus explain a, minus it. Minus zero, zero, but zero <laughs> Fahrenheit. Like humans don't like it's it's uncomfortable less than zero on a Fahrenheit scale for humans. It's uncomfortable if it's less than zero or more than a hundred. So therefore, Fahrenheit's a better scale. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> but I mean, hey, it doesn't get down to zero Fahrenheit in Australia. And if it's more than 100, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it's bad for humans. Fuck me. It doesn't, yeah. like, in summer, it doesn't get below 100 yeah, Fahrenheit. Isn't it like, Australia, like, like 30 degrees or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah degrees. it's a fucking weird. Yeah, but I mean, it's only one country in the world that uses Fahrenheit, um, you know, Fahrenheit in Europe. No, it's West. two. Yeah, there's two, but, you I mean, know. It's Liberia and all well, I mean, one, one yeah. doesn't matter, the other one doesn't matter even more. So. Yeah, sure. well, and in Mexico, yeah. it's just fucking hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like Alice Springs. Yeah. Yeah. It's fucking hot. And if it's not hot, it's hot and fucking wet. That's it. <laughs> and if it's not hot and fucking wet, we should have been here yesterday because it fucking was. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, back to browning mm -hmm. and bluing. But yeah, it's um, it brings brings out the the pattern on the barrels anyway when they brown them with the with the nitric acid. That one there. I've done a couple of old guns myself, but it's a tedious. Uh, process. I did a Remington action. Yeah, I know. Stupid <laughs> question for you. Here we go. You probably, if you start off with stupid question, you no, probably shouldn't ask no, it. No, no, I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm certain there's many people out there that want to know. If you want to get a nice deep blued finish to your gun as opposed to a matte blued finish, is it a different process or is it different prep work? Prep work. That's a stupid fucking question. Just answer it, dickhead. <laughs> It's all in the prep. Yeah. yeah. If you want a blue finish, if you're in WA and you want a nice blue finish on your gun, blue, we're talking like a proper blue finish, we're not talking Cerakote. If you want a proper blue finish, just take it to Craig at Alexander's, get him to do it. Don't bring it to me. I'll just take it to Craig and get him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he does a, a great job. It's an absolute beautiful job. Like, they still mix their own blue. Yeah. They don't buy premix blue solution. And the blue that they do has a much deeper luster to it, yeah? It's a lot deeper sort of finish. It's not 
It's not hazy. Like it, um, some blue finishes end up, they look, you look at them, they look smoky. Yeah. Almost. Yeah, exactly. Um, but if you prep it right, or if you get Craig to prep it right, it'll turn out mint. So it'll make a gun look like brand new again. Mm. Maybe we should get him to come in and review some of our sort of pre mixed blue Craig things sometime. Craig. I don't know if you met him. He's probably that own drink of beer. Yeah. He, he, <laughs> he should be if he's, he's not. Mature, yeah, he's not. Yeah, he should be. Yeah. He's mature, yeah. Craig. Alan will be watching. Good day, Al. Hey, Al. Good night, mate. Technically, there's only 18 people watching, so. Is there? Yeah. I don't know where everybody is. Get online, you dickheads. Well, the problem was is that we spent it, we went off for a month. Yeah, but yeah. last last week we got 10,000 views. Yeah. Last week we got 10,000 views. Oh, we got more than that. Well, that's what I was at when I stopped counting. Oh, okay. Anyway. Ran out, of fin- ran out of fingers, did you? Well, 9,900 were more mum, but... <laughs> <laughs> of course they were. Not even my mum watches this show. But yeah, if, if people want to make... Fancy looking little knives. If you can find a piece of Damascus uh, steel, and the easiest way to do that is to find an old someone, one of the gunsmiths who's got a. Have you got any Damascus steel? The easiest way to do that is to cut up your granddad's shotgun. I just can't remember what I wanted to remind of this. If we can find, if you guys want, if you want some Damascus barrel steel, we'll, we'll flatten some barrels out, write some barrels off, flatten them out, and we'll cut it up and we'll I'll sell you some. Barrel steel. I was going to say, you know what's going to end up happening? There's going to be a whole heap of granddads walking around tomorrow with half an inch or an inch lopped off the end of their old fucking shotgun. Yeah. Like your hose, yeah. if you live in like Midland or Langford or yeah. Armadale, yeah, you, when your hose, you just get a little bit of your hose missing. I don't know why that is. <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying? There's going to be people walking around on the weekend with fucking knives made out of bong hose. That's <laughs> it, made out of bong hose. <laughs> Welcome to Armadale. Oh, <laughs> you get stabbed it. by a green hardy flex hose. <laughs> that's it. Oh, you know, I've got, I've got the Pope. I've got the good stuff. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I've got the Pope. Pope. <laughs> We're on Pope hose. <laughs> uh, sorry to the people from Dramadale. But anyway, folks, you don't own phones anyway, so if, if you are at all interested, uh, I'm not sure if this guy comes back up here to Perth. Occasionally to um, do these courses, it's well worth well worth going along. It's good fun, meet a lot of people. Yeah, it's a really good skill to have in, in your repertoire. Like you may never use it, but it's very applicable to a, a range of other things yeah. as well. The zombies are coming though. That's it, and that's why you need something like that. <laughs> Shape, shaping them. I think that was made out of a leaf spring. Yeah, I've almost got to finish. The leaf spring out of a volcano truck. Five years, yeah. Yeah. But, but there you go. Not not difficult, but you can turn out quite a quite a professional looking knife with a mm. with a little bit of work. Um, you were going to explain the rest of the process to make them. I can't remember. God, I'm old. You know? <laughs> I've, got, I've got the paperwork there. I think then when you set out the length and you mark the ricasso, and then you draw out your knife, and then you draw your tang. Yeah. And you, I just remember you. Um, Heat it, heat it up, red hot, and you use a hammer and a, uh, a, a lot two, of block. two like U-shaped bits of steel yeah. to bring in the where the um, taper for the tang starts, yeah. and then you draw your tang out from there. Yeah. But what what have you got on those? Oh, I can't remember. This this is a piece of um, burl. I think that's mallee root burl or something like yeah. that. Isn't it? Do you mean you haven't got any any Enfield stock in any of those? No, I haven't. Oh. No, I don't think so. That, that's that's something. I think that's a bit of shri oak that one. But that that's a, either a burl off a burl off a white like gun. That looks like that looks like Jarrah or something. Well, it looks like a brown smear from there. So let's bring it <laughs> over here. But this this one is quite a fancy little bit of figure in that. It's and then it's got ebony tips on them, don't I? Yeah, these are, this is ebony. It definitely looks much better in person than it does on this camera. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, oh. it's hard to, you know, appreciate. I'd, I'd light it better, but I don't care that much. <laughs> it's actually pretty straight, this one. Production at its best. Absolutely. Mine's not. Mine's got a big, big wolf set. <laughs> but they do work, too. I've used this one a little bit. 
Mainly for cutting up the uh, cake. birthday cake. Yeah. <laughs> Which, by the way, pretty important for an old bloke like me when you're counting down, not counting up. <laughs> counting down? <laughs> That's a bit morbid. Yeah, it wasn't morbid, right. to be honest. Alright. Travis reckons he's not that bad, he's only had to replace his garden hose once every week when he's in the <laughs> <laughs> I come up with the idea of talking about knives tonight, I'm like about different shapes, different, um, whether you've got drop point knives with lots of belly and daggers and that sort of shit, and then all of us realise that we don't know shit about knives. So we weren't going to talk about designs. But if you've got a design of knife that you like, um, throw, us not. throw it in the comments below. Throw it in the comments. Yeah. Oh, your numbers have picked up a little bit. Oh, no, a little bit. That's all right. So, all right, what else are we talking about tonight? I don't know. I know that you've got a you've got a couple of uh, pull aparts there that you want to do. Are we going to do them last, or no? I reckon we get into them fairly oh, early because yeah. okay. then we've got the uh, you know the caliber the caliber debate once okay. again. And just in case I do take all that and put back together. Yeah. Oh, and plus we we've got to talk about what we're going to run for specials this this month as well. Yes. Yep, which is pretty easy. All safes. Yeah, I'll let you guys sort that out. Well, no, don't talk about it now. We'll talk about it mm. All right, so I've got a ticker. This is a T3X uh, in 243. And I've also got a, a Lidgo LA102 in what colour is it? 308. 308. It is the signature series. So signature series. Try, try not to dent it. So I'm just going to run through both of these. Um, as firearms, because I get asked a lot about both of these and what I like and what I don't like about the designs and they're very similar internal and I've said this quite a few times is that you know, a ticker is a really good design and the way that they've made it is really good the Lithgo, I really see that as an amalgamation of about five different rifles um, so I really think um, like enthusiasts design the Lithgo as opposed to engineers who design stuff like the tickers, yeah? Um, so with the ticker, uh, I'll take the bolt out first, just so you guys know that it's unloaded. So they've got a two lug bolt. So you've got two lugs up the top there, and you've got what we call a Seiko style extractor, which is a very typical like um, Seiko design um, that you fit to other guns like Remington's and stuff as well, because Remington extractors are shit. And, um, but there's no pins or anything to hold it in, yeah? The spring pressure from the pin that applies the spring pressure to the claw to pull the cases out, that also holds the extractor in. So it's a pretty good design. Um, uh, plunger extractor, all that sort of stuff. So it's a skinny bolt design, so the lugs are bigger than the bolt, and I'll talk about that later when we're looking at the Lithgo. Um, the bolt handles on the tickers uh, go through it like a dovetail that's machined in the bolt, um, and they slide through and they're actually held in there by the, the main firing pin assembly so that you can't pull it out without pulling the firing pin out first um, which I don't really like that design I've seen a couple of these things broken off like stuck case and someone's broken the handle off belting them open um, the bolt shrouds are better than what they used to be they used to be made out of plastic now they're made out of alley um, which was an uh, upgrade that they'd made between the T3 and the T3X oh, that was it. You can, and if you do have a T, you do it. Big if you do have a T3, then there is the upgrade kit to upgrade them to the T3X. Yeah. Um, oh, you did too. Which has the Showed new ultra and a couple other features. Nah, nah. Which will be able to work out. You've got to push that there. No, what you do is pull it back and sit it on there. Oh, I saw a smart bike doing it. Hey, Craig. Craig from Alexander. Oh, Craig from Alexander well, again. We've got, got another show. He's got a Craig. Craig. It's, it's Craig's show tonight. Yeah. yeah, but can you do it like. Can you do it on a rainy day in Glasgow? Yeah. That's the question. Hey, look at that. Hey. Now, now it's nice and free. Yeah. This will come out now. Yeah, so that's loose. The bolt handle comes out and the firing striker assembly comes out. So it's really cool. You can get it apart. By hand. By yeah. hand out in the bush with no tools. Well, not quite as easy as getting a hour or a weatherby apart, but hey. Yeah, it's not far off it though. Yeah. And then you just line that back, you put your slide we, your bolt handle back in. So if you buy an aftermarket bolt handle for a ticker, you can put it in yourself at home. You can come in and pay me to do it, but I'm just gonna do this. And charge you 200 bucks. Yeah, charge your shit then. You <laughs> and then you rotate that back and you're done. Yeah. And that slides back on there. That is pretty cool. Should have race that. It's totally not gay. I reckon I can get the 
Van Gogh. Well, oh, I guarantee. Yeah. Well, maybe not with those little hands, but I reckon I could. So that's the bolt on a ticker. So you get your bolt release on the side there, magazine in the bottom, latches on the front, plastic mag, three shot mag, uh, plastic oh, trigger guard. So uh, the next stage is they come with. Do they still come with the tool? Ah, uh, yeah. So it's Torx head. I think it's T15 Torx heads. Not 15, 25. 25 or something. Yeah. yeah. 17.6 front and rear uh, Chris the other items there's a recoil lug and there's one other thing there yeah. something else recoil lug recoil lug bolt but, shroud bolt shroud bolt plate no no um, I will think it will go through yeah there is trigger guard comes out plastic still plastic comes off. still plastic you want a metal one you can get one from Atlas Works if you want a metal one, buy a fucking Seiko. <laughs> like, that's that's the point of the ticket. Like, yeah, you know, like... <laughs> well, Tickets are made to a price, so they don't have to... Look, they don't have to make Seiko shit. I like the way that I've got him talking about the good things of these. Mm. And he's just... He's bubbling with rage at the moment. Like No, it's a fucking off. stupid thing to say. Like, Do you want a metal? Mm, 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 buy a mm, fucking mm, Seiko. <laughs> All right, a bit of wood on this actually isn't too bad. It is nice. That's why the Seikos are a thousand bucks or more dearer. Yeah, that's right. Because they've got a lot of stitch metal in them. But the, this is the thing. They made the ticker so they can produce a, a product at a price range to suit the market without making the Seikos shit. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Sure. It's like the same as Weatherby's. Weatherby Mark V, that's their top of the line made in the USA gun. Whether it be Vanguard is made in Japan, so they've got a rifle manufactured at a price point for the market. So they don't have to try and make the Mark V's like cheap to yeah. make to compete in the same and, market. And Ruger have done the same. The Model 77 is, is sort of is up here and the, the Wendy's uh, are up here. The, well, yeah, the Ruger well, 77s well, are well, like in here. Well, I would but the Ruger, like, rather than make their guns shit. They just use processes to make them cheaper to manufacture. Investment casting processes. Yeah, that's right. But then they introduced the Ruger American. That was, to, again, to produce yeah. a product out of at a point of market. Yeah. As opposed to Remington, who just made their product shit and then got <laughs> chucked in the bin. Yeah, like, and, well, the whole company went in the bin and then it got sold off. And that's not for no reason. That's right. Um, so, yeah, this is the Seiko, uh, right. Seiko ticker. It's got... Uh, those two screws, and it's got a recoil lug, metal recoil lug that's in the stock. Well, that's, yeah, that's one. Of, that's one of the things that comes in the T3. Yeah, the recoil yeah. lug. And steel the, now. The steel steel instead of alloy. Yeah. yeah, and it fits into this slot that they put in the in the action. Yeah, the barrels are a bit smaller than most like Weatherby's and Howlers and stuff, so they're about two and a half mil smaller in diameter because the actions are smaller. Because instead of having a twenty six mil thread, these have only got a one inch thread, or they yeah, one inch thread, yeah, one inch thread. Um, so yeah, it's a bit, everything's a little bit slimmer. Um, but if you look at it, like when it's in the stock, it's got these flats on it. But when you actually pull it out of the stock and look at it, it's made out of a piece of round, like a Remington. So they make it out of a piece of round and then put these flats on it. They might hammer forge them in there, but regardless of how it's done, that's how they do it. And that's why there's no recoil lug on the action. They just put a slot and put the recoil lug in the stock. That way they can make this out of a piece of round. Yeah, so it's ease of production. So like, to, yeah, that's what it is. It's made the ticket's made to a price. The Seiko's made to a quality. Yeah, although the, the ticket's pretty good the ticket's quality pretty good. as well. Yeah. yeah, well, the performance is similar. Yeah, but that's that's like well, I mean, my Commodore drives me to the shops just as well as the next person's BMW. You yeah. don't buy a BMW yeah. because it goes to the shops in the same sort of time frame. So you buy it a bit wanker. That's right. <laughs> like like an Audi. Yeah. yeah that's or a Ford GT. <laughs> you've got taste and fucking class. No, no, but you know what I'm saying. Like, um, realistically, uh, but that is the thing. Like, people who've got taste and class and can appreciate the difference a Seiko offers, um, right. being a much nicer firearm, um, invest in that. But not everyone wants to make that investment. Anyway, um, the... The bolt stops held in with a pin that only goes in from one direction, so if you bend the pin, you can't get the fucking out. Um, good thing, mate, good thing. It's one action length, so 223 all up, 300 in mag is the same action. They just make the bolt stop 
shorter and they block the mag and block the mags up. Um, and there's good and bad things to that. So means you've got a, a heap of extra of metal on a 223 unnecessarily. Um, mm. But it means that you can convert a 223 to 300 with mag. You just don't <coughs> turn it off uh, if you wanted to. You know, so there's advantages and disadvantages. Right? But it's a okay. slim action. You know, uh, the triggers are good. They're not. They're not great. They're not. They're not bad. Um, they're only adjustable for weight. Like that's the only adjustment you've got. So if they say, "Oh, a fully adjustable trigger," they're not really any adjustable, more adjustable than anything else. Um, so yeah. So uh, you'd be happy with the trigger if you want. Now let's have a look at the at the lift go, and let's have a look at some of the, the comparisons to other firearms. Okay, so lift go straight away. Bolt stops in the same position on the back here. Um, but what you'll notice is that with a lift go, the bolt, the bolt body is the same diameter as the lugs. This is what they call a fat bolt design. So a fat bolt design means you can just bore a hole in the action to fit the bolt and just machine a little area for the lugs. With a with a design like the, the ticker, you've actually got to broach the raceways or forge the raceways into the action for full length. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both, but generally speaking, any gun that's got a fat bolt is generally much smoother than a gun that's had raceways breached. Sorry. Hi Steph. Thanks for watching. Hey Steph. <laughs> How's it going? Right. So, Lithgo has a three position safety on the back, a la Winchester Model 70. So they ripped this idea directly from Winchester Model 70, but they made it their own, because in the Winchester Model 70, the middle position locks the trigger but not the bolt, and then at the rear position, it locks both. On the Lithgo, the middle position locks the trigger and the bolt, and the rear position uh, only locks the trigger. So then you can open the bolt. Ooh, big difference. Okay. <laughs> so, but it allows you to take. So, what you do is on the on the Winchester as well, but on the Lithgo, you put the latch all the way back, and then when you take the bolt out, uh, no scoop. But the Lithgo doesn't come with the bolt fluted normally. It's only in their signature series. If you want your bolt fluted, come and talk to us, and we can get it done. Um, there's a company over east, Total Solutions Engineering, the guys that make our barrels for us. They got all the machinery to machine flutes into the bolts for you. Um, and flutes into your barrels. And they do a few different styles too, so if you want it fast, slow, crossed, straight, any of that stuff they can do. Um, Scoot probably wants it non-binary. <laughs> you know, you can get bent flutes, straight flutes, <laughs> but with scoops it's like a non-binary flute. So they do like a... Do they make a flute that goes both ways? Or... <laughs> they do, they do a flute that both goes both... Um, right, <laughs> so the, the, the spring pressure Coral's has good. been taken up by the by the, the safety at the back. The safety's holding the, Whoops, the, safety's holding the, the sp striker assembly back. And so there is a lock here on the side that stops the bolt, uh, the shroud from rotating at the rear point, which is a real crossover from Winchester, but Winchester stole it from Morley, yeah? Because Moore's, the original 98s, are so worried when you open the bolt, if they decock the bolt, you wouldn't be able to get another round back in and go and shoot Tommies. Um, so that's a follow-up from that. Other people have gotten around it, like um, Ticker and Howard and those guys, just have a little detent for the striker to sit in. That's not a big deal. It just means it, it, you, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. It, it's not something I'm going to get into now. Uh, anyway, so you can just you push that in, and then it allows you to rotate the bolt shroud and then you can take the striker assembly up. Now this striker assembly is held in not like a Winchester, it's held in like a Howler. Yeah? Because it's just got that single lug on there that locks. Yeah. Winchester's Winchester's a threaded through. But you have to have it on full safe to do this, yeah? Yeah, yeah. And you, you can take that out and clean it if you want to. You know, if you've had a burst firing uh, burst primer or something like that and you've got some shit in the bolt, you can just take it apart. Who'd have those on regular occurrences? You. Don't know. <laughs> um, so it's got what, a sliding um, extractor which has benefits and drawbacks. Uh, Savage make that style of design. I don't really know one that's failed. I've seen one person tear the extractor out of the bolt face, but that's extreme. 
Post 64, Winchester used that extractor. Yeah, they do, don't they? Post yeah. 64s. Um, uh, and Stollies, I think, funny enough. Stolly yeah. used that style of extractor because they had a, someone with a Seiko type extractor have a case rupture and it blew the extractor out. And the problem was is that he was a left-hander shooting a right-handed gun. So the extractor came out, hit him, hit him in the eye actually, he went blind in one eye. But that's rare, yeah, that, like, that's really weird. You don't see that normally. Oh, I don't even find that amazing. Why? And funny. Because it happened to him, I suppose. Yeah, left hander. <laughs> Who'd be left hander? Useless bastards. Yeah, I don't know. Shoot right hand hand guns. I don't know. Yeah, just, just fucking learn to shoot right hand. Just learn to be normal, wouldn't you? Yeah, just yeah, learn yeah. to be normal. You think so? Well, I used to stone at birth, didn't I? Oh, don't. <laughs> this one's got the, the fancy handle. Oh, that's the other thing. You take the, the striker out and the bolt handle is held in with a four mil screw. Four mil or five mil screw okay. in through there. You just undo that and it comes out. And that's weak as piss. I haven't heard of someone breaking one of them off yet, but I'll, I'll, I'll deliberately get a case stuck just to break the handle off and complain to lift go. I know. Because I don't like that. I know thing. one guy that that actually came loose on. Yeah, I don't doubt it. They lock tied them in there and they're done up fucking tight, but I, I know someone's going to have a problem with it. Oh, I just know. Yeah, I think we've had one come loose. Yeah, Dave Most. Oh, right. He's thrown at Wimag, came loose. Oh, uh, you know why? Because it's thrown at Wimag. And because I pulled it apart. Yeah. <laughs> and put it back together. Um, but smooth. These things run smoothly. They are, they're very smooth. So, magazine is actually. Bad. Bad. For, a, for a normal two bag bolt design, the ticket is pretty smooth too. Yeah, but that's they're smooth because they've got so much tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a huge amount of tolerance between the bolt and the bolt raceway I mean, on a ticker. I mean, oh, my, silly. I mean, my hand runs. Well, I can show you right now. Put it in there. My hand runs really smoothly in a bucket too. <laughs> that's it. Bucket of slot. Like if you push the ticker bolt in there, there's actually a, a considerable amount of hold the action properly. There's actually a considerable amount of movement. Not as much as a like a Morza style action. No. But there is a, a fair amount of movement there. You're talking, yeah. you know, yeah. probably 60 thou. Well, not quite, but probably 40 thou anyway. Yeah. At the rear here, yeah. you know. So they're really loose in there, relatively speaking. But really, truly, that doesn't matter. You don't want to lose. It doesn't. It doesn't affect the form. When, when it's like but, that, you don't want to lose. No. But, but lithgos are smooth without having that much tolerance. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like the the fit of a lithgo bolt to its bolt raceway. <laughs> is half the tolerance of a, of a ticker, you know, like they're very smooth. Yeah. And that comes down to the way that the actions were made, the fat bolt design, you know. Um, now, but the fat bolt design, the downside of a fat bolt design is you remove more material out of the action, so the actions aren't as stiff for the same outside diameter. Yeah. But these actions are fatter than a ticker action, so that makes up for it. Um, mags. Magazines, ticker and Lithgow mags are actually Pretty much identical. Someone reckons like they like Lucky Thirteen were making different ones, but to be honest, all the the thread we make Lithgos that we built, we just put ticker mags in them. So that's Lithgo with a Lithgo mag. That's with the ticker mag. Yeah. Well, it's the same. Yeah. So if we, you've got a Lithgo and you can't find a mag, or vice, or if you've got a ticker and you can't find a mag, just get a Lithgo. We have it. been told that. We, we should check them on each rifle to make sure that, and we do, that yeah. they feed correctly, which we do. Um, but to be all fair, I've never had one not feed and the other in the centerfire Lithgo to ticker stuff. It's only really been the uh, ticker rimfires to the CZ. Which use the CZ. Uh, uh, sorry, the Lithgo uh, ticker rimfire. The, the Lithgo rimfire to a CZ magazine, yeah. which um, most of them feed, but some don't. Yeah. Maybe that's an idea for another video. Yeah. Pull apart two rim fires. Um, six mil screws, so just standard six mil screws. You get down at sales fasteners or whatever. Um, with five mil heads, so it's pretty pretty standard. Uh, plastic trigger guard, same as the ticker. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, they're not the same, they're similar. Same idea. Yeah, and then the stock comes off. Okay, so whereas the ticker... Um, Do I start with recoil then? Uh, you, okay, we can start with recoil. Right? Let's put the actions next to each other, right? So... Put that there and that there. Hold on. Put that side over there. 
Okay, so if you look at the two of them, they, they actually recoil the same way. So if you look at the ticker, they've got the recoil lug machined here, and the Lithgow's got it machined here. But with the ticker, they've got the, the recoil lug machine there and the screw here. Lithgo, other way around. Screws here, recoil lugs there. Why the fuck would you do that? Like, if you were making an action to try and copy this action, if you're ripping that idea, just make the bottom of the actions the same. Please. And that way, when you've made your Lithgo action, then you just use all the ticker stuff. You just use ticker stocks. Everyone makes ticker stocks. GRS, Macmillan, um, MDT, everyone makes ticker stuff. No, we've got to be different. Why make it different? Why make everything else the same and then make that different? Anyway, so... You really got... You did really well. The dealing you done, with you've done really well. You've got so far. I've still got a lot of time to talk about something positive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't like that. Um, you can see the barrel thread in here. Lithgo use a bigger barrel thread. And the reason they do that is because the the barrel, what we call the you know, the the knock cylinder, uh, the threaded section of the barrel, the bolt actually goes down inside the barrel considerably. Like um, you've probably heard of the term three rings of steel, which Remington use, which is just like a little nose of the bolt goes inside the barrel, not the lithgo. The whole fucking thing goes in there. <laughs> yeah, like balls and all goes straight into the barrel and locks up. And so you've got to have a bigger barrel to be able to fit this big bolt in there. And so you can see the thread in the recoil lug here, yeah? Why is that a bad idea? Because idiots bed their own rifles and fill the fucking things up with bedding compound so gunsmiths can't pull the barrels out, yeah? Every barrel that we pull out where someone's bedded it themselves, the root of the barrel is full of fucking bedding compound. So... And that screw hole there goes through the action into the barrel. So they can get a decent amount of thread on it because the wall of the actions are thin because they've got this big barrel that comes in there. And a big bolt up the other. Up and big <laughs> up the middle. Right, they've got the magazine guide catch screwed onto the bottom of the action, whereas the ticker, it's in the floor plate. And that is a brilliant idea. Really, really good, much better than ticker. Why? Because if you get a ticker and swap the stocks over, the magazines don't feed. Because it, it changes the distance between the action and where the magazine latches. With the Lithgo, because there's blocks on the bottom of the action, I don't know why ticker don't do this, because they do it with the Seiko. Seiko rifles have the lug on the action to hold the magazine. And so the relationship between the magazine and the bottom of the gun and where the bolt sits, the strip rounds off is exactly the same every time. So that's a great idea. There you go, I said something nice. Yeah, but you didn't say it positively. You still said it boiling with rage. <laughs> I'm just, it's just the rage. It's just the rage is, is washing out. I'm telling you, I really like this! It's going to take a while to get, get rid of that stupid fucking barrel. <sighs> okay, uh, the spring is on the front of the trigger, like the ticker. So it just applies some spring pressure to the magazine, pushes them forward and up at the rear. Uh, to make sure the rounds feed out correctly, which is really good. Lithgo, oh, fuck me. That little block <laughs> slides in. It slides onto the floor. And under the counter. It, there's a dovetail on the back of the action, and this block slides in there, and that's what you screw the rear screw into. So how do you bet on that? So we've had guys come in with their Lithgo shooting like shit, claim that they've never had the action or anything out of the stock, and yet these were not actually in the action themselves. In the dovetail, they were sitting in the stock. Yeah, so... So it's not pointing down. Wh whether or not you believe them or not, it's a different matter, but... I... Yeah, I know why they do that. They do it because they make the actions relatively thin. There's not a lot of material in them after they've got that big-ass barrel and bolt and everything stuck into them. There's not a lot of material left. Because they're making it out of a piece of round, they have to dovetail this thing in there. Um, CZs do the same thing with their rim flies. I'm not saying it's good, I just understand why it's why they do it. It's actually a really shit idea. Um, yeah, because it's not a positive sort of thing. Like, you could pull that out of the dovetail without, like, well, if you did that rear really screw up, I reckon you'd pull that out of the dovetail without too many problems. Oh, maybe. Well, I'd do it, maybe not you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, anyway. But if, if I was going to do some accurizing and, and, and bed that, 
I would make a steel one and seal the solder it into place so it can't mm. move. I was going to make a joke that you would make a steel one and seal the solder it into place, but you beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually probably not a bad idea, yeah? It's because it, you can get the rear of the action a little bit warm, you know, with silver yeah. solder, it's fine, you know, like yeah. soft solder, you can yeah. get it to run easily and then it would stay in place and it wouldn't move and you could bed the back of the gun easier. Yeah. It'd be much better. Um, they've got these two slots down the side. Again, I know why they're there. They're there to lighten the gun down. The problem is, is that if you get bedding compound weep into that area while you're trying to bed it, you'll never get it out of the stock without destroying the stock. Um, so you've got to fill those lines up with putty before you bed a uh, lift go. Trigger. So the trigger actually has three adjustments on them. They cover them all in, in goo though, so you can't actually do anything to them. So why make an adjustable trigger? But you can adjust the... They're, they're not the only company that puts glue on their, on their adjustments though. Your favorite no, company, no. Remington, do it. Yeah, but Remington are fucking weird. How do it? Those, those yeah, how have it. only got one adjustment screw though. Yeah, but it's still covered in glue. <laughs> um, yeah, but you can move it still. You just all that glue is there is to stop the the from screw from moving up. by yeah by harmonics. Yep. These are there like this glue that they use is pretty serious shit. Yeah, it's 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 um, the blue stuff, not the white stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I can you can get it out and play with it. Um, but they've actually got adjustments for you know spring pressure after travel uh, spring pressure and sear engagement. Sorry, actually as I move that, I can feel that moving. Because that one's not actually done up very tight. We better check that before we send it out. Where is that? Oh. That's moving on that. Yeah, that whole block is moving. Yeah. Because that block is just held in there with those pins. That block's a separate piece. Oh, that's weird. Why would you do that? Just make it out of one piece. Oh, because what they're doing is they're using a mono block and just slotting it down the back and then putting a... Yeah, okay. Well, you learn something new every day. Um, but the other thing they do is you can see that there's a little, two little pins here that are on the action that hold the trigger, like locate the trigger. Why have they got them? What you'll find is if you take this Allen key out, that where the Allen key goes through the trigger is also slotted. So the whole trigger can move back and forth on the action. They do that because that changes the position that the sear holds the firing pin back. So what you can actually do is you can change, you're not supposed to, and this is not why they made it like this. They made it like this just to get around um, is other issues associated with um, tolerances and shit. But if you move the trigger all, all the way back in the, on the rifle, what happens is when you go to shut the bolt, the sears hit before the bolt's moved all the way forward, yeah? And so you've actually got to push forward and down a little bit to get the bolt to go down. But it's, it's sort of smoother. If you move the trigger all the way forward, the bolt moves all the way forward before the sear is engaged. And then as you go to put the bolt handle down, it goes click and jumps onto the sear. You might have felt it. Weatherby's are really good for that one, yeah? They go, you shut the bolt and it goes click to the first stage. And then you've got to push the bolt handle down. Um, so it gives you that amount of movement. I don't think you're meant to play with that. I think they set it up at the factory and then they witness mark it. Um, so it's like where they like it. Because obviously the further you move the trigger forward, the, the longer the bolt's going to move forward to the sears engage, so the firing pin doesn't move as far. So you might have problems with, if your spring pressure's low, you might have problems with actually the gun going off. Like light, light striking. Light striking, yeah. Yeah, because I do say that they've obviously marked it. Yep there and there but yeah it's just something that i when i first pulled one of these apart i saw that and went that's fucking weird why do that um some engineer come up with the idea and then the accountant said yeah that's cheap enough mm. how much is it going to cost us oh well two roll pins and and two little yeah fucking just do it yeah. Yeah. if it's going to save us warranty issues you know yeah. um so yeah, so that's the underneath of these two rifles. Um, oh, the only other thing is that that big barrel, the, the root of the barrel here where the, where the bolt actually goes up, the barrel actually crushes an insert into the action here. In between the action and the barrel, there's this insert. A la Steyr. Steyr? Yeah. Steyr? 
Sour. Oh, sour. Sour. No, and uh, Manlika. Yeah, Stein Manlika. Stein Manlika, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that, 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 <laughs> there's that ring in there. Which is the lugs for the bot to lock into. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I better talk to fucking Ross about that on Monday. Because I know he had one. If you take this lug off, there's a pin there yeah. which locates this lug. Yeah. It also locates that insert. Yeah. So if that pin was to break, when you go to put the bolt in and shut the bolt, if that insert turns with the bolt, it won't lock up and the bolt will come out the back. You're in 5% and then you get a battery bank. You didn't charge it. Oh, okay. It's about to die. Well, if it dies, it dies. 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 Um, we can kill it. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, anyway, so that's the two guns. Alright, let's rip the shit out of fucking... Let's put these back together first. Alright, give me a lift out stuff. So, either one, though, def rag. definitely worth buying. They're both, nice guns. Both great guns. Both well priced. Yeah. But yeah, so that, that barrel design I was asked about during the week, it's a weird design, yeah? It doesn't mean anything to the end user. It's just harder for gunsmiths um, because you need to order barrels with longer knock forms. Yeah, they fall out. So, everything that Zane just picked on there pretty much is a gunsmithing issue rather than a end user issue. So, if you're looking at buying one of these rifles, definitely don't look at these as cons because they're not. They're only cons if you want to get someone to work on them. Did you just lose that thing out the back? Yeah, I'll put it in there. So, was it what you're saying? Is it just ignore Zane? No, no. I'm just saying like. If you knew the ins and outs of your car, as from a mechanical point of view, most people wouldn't buy any. That's right. You know, it doesn't affect what happens for the user, it just generally affects the guy that has to fix it when it fucks up. Well, the so, solution to that is.